So hi everyone that's joined so far. Um, I'm Laura from St George's Hospital, and I thought I'd talk about uh, neonatal nutrition because you know what's not to like about neonatal nutrition. Um, I'm so, hopefully I, you can see that I'm sitting in the least messy bit of my lounge. So uh, okay, how do I move these slides on? Ta -da. Not like that. Okay, I'm not very good at this yet, so bear with me. Uh, how do I move the slides on, chaps? There we go, got it. Okay, so for nutrition, there's just really two really important questions to ask ourselves is, and why is good nutrition important for babies? And how do we do this? So first of all, the why. Um, neonatologists are super obsessed about growth, as you probably have realized by now. And it really stems from work done sort of in the early 2000s. Uh, this is a, a study from 2014 from Lucas et al, which showed, um, which basically takes all our SEND data and um, shows us not really how babies should grow or how they could grow, but how they do grow or how they did grow back in 2014. And as you can see from uh, the, the line here, which represents 22 to 33 weeks, uh, 23 to, to 22 to 23 weeks, you tend to fall a couple of centile spaces below your original centile space by the time you're ready to be discharged. 31 weeks back to, in 2014, you, you fell about a centile and a half of a space and then you evened out and, and started to grow again. So you know that um, having a period of neonatal intensive care is associated with a, a sort of a growth deficit. And what can we do about it and why is that important? So this is from work from uh, Nick Embleton. Uh, there is a Mars bar over here. And you're probably thinking, why a Mars bar? It's because when you're born at 24 weeks, you're mostly water. So when you're 550 grams and you're mostly water, 90% of you is water, that's about 55 grams of actual baby or a Mars bar of baby. So next time you look at an incubator, you think Mars bar. Um, and this is his uh, Nick Emerson's work from uh, 2001, which really fired the starting gun on all of us thinking about neonatal nutrition. And that shows your recommended intake of the blue bar. Is everything okay? Recommended index are the blue bars, and the actual intake are the green bars. And your cumulative de deficit is the is the um, uh, the bars which are pointing down over here. Can I do that? Da, da, da. Yeah, the bars. So as you can see, you build up a cumulative deficit in calories and in protein and, and all the components which make up growth. Um, and this is because when you're born in 24 weeks, you are um, you know, born with a gastrointestinal tract which is fully anatomically there, but not completely functional. So, so you can't pour in full feeds into a 24 week straight away, um, and you have to provide nutrition in other ways. So what's the link between growth and neurodevelopment? This is quite a thorny issue because it's quite a difficult proof because neurodevelopment is a sort of sum total of your entire neonatal stay uh, of which growth is just a part. This is work from Aaron Cransadol, which shows us that if you grow in the fastest quartile, you have the best a neurodevelopmental um, outcome. So you have a, the least chance of having an MDI below 70. So this is a highest growth quartile and least chance of having an MDI below 70 or a PDI below 70, cerebral palsy or neurodevelopmental impairment in any way. So this is a really sort of, um, sort of, um, you know, sort of wide view of looking at it because as we said, it's, it's, it's kind of neurodevelopment is a sum total of what happens to you. So it's not only about growth, but it's certainly a very, interesting indicator. This is always a big, this is another big question that sort of haunts us a little bit and is bigger always better? Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the Barker hypothesis of the thrifty phenotype, which is um, essentially that if you have uh, a uterine environment which uh, provides you with a poor source of calories, your metabolism sets to adapt to that environment. And then when you're born and you're put in a, into a calorie rich environment, your metabolism becomes overwhelmed and you become more likely to get things like uh, type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease later on in adult life. So babies who are born or small for gestational age and show rapid catch up growth during the first year of life will find to be at the highest risk of having metabolic type illnesses later in life. So that's a Barker hypothesis. 
how does that apply to um and and a little bit of uh, other information to support that was um from the dutch famine uh, which is baby thorn during that last winter when there was a push to liberate northern and western holland um and um they didn't make it for that last winter and a large proportion of the dutch population starved you, i know this because i'm dutch um and babies who were in gestation during that period were calorie deprived and were small when they were born and that population had shown a higher incidence than normal for the dutch population of type 2 diabetes in middle age which is very interesting stuff more recently uh, this is another dutch study uh, looking at preterm and small for gestational age infants and, and again showing um that link um sort of slightly contrary to that 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 evidence that we've got from the from the barker hypothesis and from the uh, dutch um, hunger winter study is from nick hamilton all published in 2016 which says that um your early pre-discharge growth and up to 12 weeks post-discharge doesn't appear to be associated with adverse metabolic outcomes later on but your growth, which occurs at more than a year of age, is strongly associated with adverse metabolic outcomes. So I think we still haven't quite worked out where that where that period of metabolic programming actually occurs. Is it in utero, i.e. Uh, is it in the pre-discharge phase for our preterm babies? Is it, um, is it after discharge? Is it in early infancy? Um, so, so that's still up for debate. Um, and the other thing to remember is that that it, we, um, sorry about this, this is a joke, a rock and a hard place. So it would appear to be that um, good catch up growth, I'm just going to go back because it drives everyone crazy, like good growth. So it would be good for your brain, but good growth could also be bad for your metabolic outcome later on in life, i.e., your risk of having cardiovascular disease. Uh, so, rock and a hard place. So, how do we deliver? Um, neonatal nutrition on the neonatal unit two ways parental and enteral um, and um, so why parental nutrition we've already talked about the fact that when you're born at you know really immature gestations you have a very small amount of tissue and you have a very limited means of acquiring new body tissue um, so uh, especially using enteral nutrition. So PN is not only essential for survival, it's also essential for good cognitive outcomes. But what are the basic building blocks of PN? There are water, uh, glucose, um, an amino acid solution, which in our case is usually vamine or primine, and a lipid solution. So just to, to say about the amino acid solutions, they are um, the two different ones that are available are based on two different ways of thinking about amino acid balance. One is based on the amino acid profile in breast milk, and the other is based on the amino acid profile in cord blood. Neither of these amino acid mixtures are entirely perfect, and I think that's the next sort of growth area of parental nutrition research for neonates, is that um, looking at different amino acid mixtures and seeing what's optimal. Um, electrolytes, um, vitamins, and of course trace elements, which are also added in. I'm going to talk a little bit about the NICE guideline on neonatal parental nutrition because that's been recently published in February of this year and is a latest sort of guidance, guidance document that's um, been published in the UK. So I think it's a good idea to kind of know what's in that, basically. Um, so, um, first of all, the indications for, for and timing of neonatal parental nutrition. And uh, NICE has given the indications for starting parental nutrition in terms of gestational age. Other guidelines have talked about um, gestational age and a birth weight cutoff. This guideline has focused on gestational age, and the reason that was done is because they wanted it to be a, a really sort of clear-cut distinction between babies, you know, so that, so that people wouldn't uh, uh, sort of try and match two criteria or, or make things particularly difficult. So anyway, so this is for babies born before 31 weeks gestation. So all babies born at um, 30 plus six weeks cessation um, and below will need parental nutrition. This is quite a big change because it means that babies born on level two uh, units will routinely receive parental nutrition. And, and, and it means that level two units will also have to start to focus on what it is that they deliver in their neonatal nutrition. Um, for babies that are in that sort of 
moderately preterm group, i.e. born after 31 weeks of station, but not yet 34, 35 weeks of station. Um, there is a caveat to start on parental nutrition if you're not making progress with enteral nutrition after the first three days. Um, and this is to allow a little bit of wriggle room to kind of really, um, you know, allow a little bit of clinical judgment as well, because there's always going to be those 31 weekers that, that surprise us, that don't do as well as they should, or where there's a problem with delivering internal nutrition, and that then you've got to have that sort of fallback option of providing parental nutrition. And obviously for babies with congenital uh, gut disorders or where they're so sick that they won't tolerate milk feeds, um, you've also got to think about providing parental nutrition for those babies. Um, so for preterm babies on enteral feeds, you start parental nutrition um, within 48 hours. So this slide is really about the criteria for restarting parental nutrition after you've stopped enteral feeds. And it's to stop that situation on neonatal units, which occurs quite a lot, which is where that where feeds get stopped because there's been a couple of green aspirates or there's a suspicion of sepsis or something like that, and we've stopped feeds overnight. The next day they're not restarted, and the next day they're not restarted, and before you know it, you have three days without any any nutrition whatsoever going in, not enteral, not parenteral, or, or you have um, a, a picture where you have three days of, of insufficient nutrition going in. So this is to sort of remind everyone to not that nutrition is is it's like oxygen, and it's just as important, and you need to start thinking about putting it back as soon as you can. Um, and so this slide is basically the criteria for restarting parental nutrition. Um, this is another really important point, so I've put it by itself in a slide of its own. So um, basically it says that when a preterm or term baby meets indications for parental nutrition, start as soon as possible and within eight hours at the latest. And this is because um, this is all about the metabolic transition that preterm infants undergo. So when a preterm baby is born, we know that, or when a baby is born, we know that it undergoes a transition from a baby in the womb to a baby outside, and you undergo those major cardiorespiratory changes, but you also undergo a major metabolic change. And for a term baby, you go from an anabolic state into a state where, which switches anabolism and catabolism in terms of when you feed and when you don't feed. But for a preterm infant, actually what you want to do is you want to maintain mostly an anabolic environment for that preterm baby in order to allow it to grow, just like it does in the womb. So in order to do that, you need to metabolically transition that baby from nutrition in utero to nutrition outside the womb and if you if you think about it if you if you're born you abruptly stop your transplacental transport of amino acids and glucose and fats and then somebody sticks you on a 10 percent glucose solution for the next few days and so that doesn't help your metabolism adapt to becoming anabolic again because there's no there's no fuel going in and there's nothing to switch you back over again to an, an, an anabolic state for growth. So, so try and so the idea behind starting preterm babies on uh, uh, parental nutrition within eight hours of birth, um, especially your little little babies, is to stop that sort of metabolic shock that they go to go through if you don't pick up that nutrition straight away. I hope that's a clear point. Um, um, you ask questions if you want to. Um, so, parental nutrition complications um, so are pretty pretty clear because you've uh, anything you deliver intravenously you can't suck out afterwards. So, fluid overload or dehydration, line sepsis is a big bugbear, hyper and hypoglycemia, diarrhea is a big one as well, electrolyte disturbances. This is mostly because people are not on top of what they should be doing with electrolytes central fatty acid depletion, and we'll talk more about encephalopathy later on, and deranged liver function tests, and also problems with uh, lipid balance. Just to do a little bit of the basic science, um, um, this is proteins and how proteins are made. So proteins basically consist of a carboxyl group, a side chain which gives that amino acid its little characteristic, and an amino group. Um, why is that important? It's, it's important in how you metabolize proteins. 
So on this slide, you can see that you take your proteins in your diet, you chop them up into amino acids, you then absorb them, and then you go and make them into proteins in your body or you use them for other reasons. However, if you don't supply the body with enough energy, the body goes, okay, well, great having all these amino acids, but actually what I need more than anything else is I need energy. So what it will do is we'll take that amino acid, top off the amino group, which you then weigh out as urea, and it will use that carbon skeleton as an energy source. So if you give protein and you don't give enough energy, the body can't utilize that protein to make tissue. So that, that, we'll come back to that point, that's quite fundamental. So these are just a few good numbers to remember. The most important number on this slide is probably the one in point two, where a positive nitrogen balance is achieved for babies with an intake of about one to one and a half grams per kilogram per day of amino acid, non-protein energy intake of about 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day. And what that says is that in order for you not to break down your own body tissue as a preterm infant, you need at least one and a half grams of amino acid and 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day of energy. Otherwise, you start taking bites out of your Mars bar, okay? In, in other words, you, you will you'll metabolize your body tissue in order to supply your energy needs. So that is why starting PN for the first day is very important to stop you going into negative nitrogen balance. Um, in order to get good growth, and in order to kind of find equal in utero uh, accretion, you probably need far higher values, three grams per kilogram per day and 90 kilocalories per kilogram per day in order to mimic in utero growth. Um, so those are those are some important numbers to kind of hang on into the back of the back. We, there's also been some recent work done looking at um, looking at safety and efficacy of giving babies higher amounts of amino acids from birth. So, uh, so 10, 15 years ago, we used to start really, really slowly with very small amounts of amino acids, which were built up very gradually over a week to 10 days. And, and we've now got some other work which suggests that actually it's safe to give reasonably high amounts of amino acid from birth. And this particular study in 2005 looked at about two and a half grams per kilogram per day of amino acid. Um, the worry about providing too much amino acid was that you would have high blood urea values that would drive a excessive urine output, but that's actually not been proven in the study. Um, we've also had a look at sort of growth outcomes with early high protein intakes, and that's been sort of less satisfactory in that um, we didn't so much find better growth, but we did find an, an, sort of an, an, an interesting side effect was that, that early PN babies did seem to reach their enteral feeds uh, sooner, which is a sort of unexpected side effect. There are two big UK PN trials that you should all be aware of. Um, one is SCAMP, which is called Morgan, and the other is NEON, which is uh, Sabita Uteo. And um, they are both uh, large randomized controlled trials of parental nutrition in the UK, and they provide our evidence base for what we recommend about uh, new, um, um, PN requirements. So SCAMP is standardized concentrated macronutrients um, and basically this is a positive study which showed that if you gave larger amounts of amino acids and energy from the start, you would get better postnatal head growth in a preterm infant. NEON was a sort of a negative study. That, that study started with high amounts of amino acids from birth, but with low amounts of energy, i.e. running into that sort of energy protein imbalance that we talked about earlier. And for, their, for them, the outcomes were not as good as babies given lower amounts of protein, which were in balance with their energy requirements. So those are the two big studies which are published about uh, nutrition. So using those two big trials, the uh, NICE has come up with some recommendations is about amino acids, and that is that we start preterm babies with a starting dose of 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram per day and gradually increase to 3 to 4 grams per kilogram per day. Um, and this is, a, this is a very important point, point two on that slide, which says that if you start parental nutrition more than, you know, if you're not starting on the day of birth, if you started it uh, later on, or if you've interrupted enteral feed, then you're restarting PN, you don't have to go all the way back to the starting dose of PN you can start at the maintenance dose, okay? Because you don't have to redo your sort of metabolic adaptation that you did at the beginning. Um, so that's a really important 
better remember because often people go that they restart parental nutrition and they go right back to day one and slowly build up again and you don't need to do that um, so for term babies, the amount of acid recommendations are, are 1 to 2 grams as a starting dose, dose and 2.5 to 3. This is important because I think as neonatologists, we tend to think of term babies as slightly bigger versions of preterm babies. Um, and actually, they're not. They have different metabolic needs and they need less amino acid because they've already done a lot of that growing. So preterm babies need to do that whole of the third trimester growth, but term babies do not. Okay, so, so that's that's important. So they need less amino acid, otherwise they get sort of problems arising from that. And again, if you start parental nutrition uh, um, not on the day of birth, you don't have to do that metabolic adaptation. Uh, so you can start at a higher level. So how do the two PN regimes that we have in London compare? So for Neil, the day one regime starts at 1.7, grams per kilogram per day of amino acids uh, and that that goes up to 2.7 as a maximum whereas a scampi n starts at 1.7 and works up to a total of 4.3 at the highest level do you remember that for both those regimes most preterm infants are grading up on their milk feeds as they are grading down on their pn so so um uh, not many preterm infants will be on 4.3 grams per kilogram per day of amino acid for terribly, terribly long. Okay, and no term infant should get more than 3.3 grams of amino acid per gram per day, which is this, this level over here, this day, day three level on the scan PN. Um, so it's not just about quality, but quantity, but also about quality. Um, so, so essentially, uh, um, we have uh, essentially and non-essential amino acids and for us the non-essential ones are um, the essential ones listed over here but for preterm babies the essential amino acids are uh, the ones with stars so in other words um, preterm babies have condition have a longer list of essential amino acids that they must get in and that they can't make or they may be conditionally essential whereby they can only make them under some conditions when they're supplied with the correct precursors so this is why um, um, it's important that you provide sufficient but also have a good quality mixture and this is why we need more work on amino acids uh, okay Do I, am i supposed to check on the chat thing while i'm going along no so coming to glucose, um, so glucose is another major component of parental nutrition. And in uh, when you're a fetus in the womb, you get five milligram per kilogram per day uh, across the placenta uh, um, um, by facilitated diffusion. Um, and we know that glucose provides a major portion of calories for parental nutrition, uh, but giving glucose in excess of your glucose oxidation rate is also bad because it gives you hyperglycemia, uh, lipogenesis and steatosis, which is deposits of uh, fat in the liver, and increased CO2 production. When you get increased CO2 production, you get somebody wanting to turn up the ventilator, which is never a good idea. Okay, so how do you know if you've overwhelmed your baby's glucose oxidation rate? Well, that's quite difficult, actually. And um, because um, I'm just going to go back to this one. That's, that's quite a difficult ask because uh, we know approximately what the glucose oxidation rate for preterm and term infant is, but you don't know how functionally that's working for your baby that you have in front of you. Because it could be affected by things like um, sepsis or uh, the baby being unwell for other reasons um, that could lead to hyperglycemia. Um, so sometimes it's a case of balancing how much glucose you deliver versus giving insulin. Okay, so the nice recommendations for giving glucose are to give between six to nine grams per kilogram per day and to gradually increase this to a maintenance dose of nine to 16 grams per kilogram per day. And if you start parental nutrition not on the day of birth, again, start at the maintenance range. Well, how does that look? in terms of, of the, of the uh, preparations we have available. So we know that NEON starts at about 8.6 grams per kilogram per day, and SCAMP uh, at 40 mil per kilogram per day starts at 4.8, and at 60 it starts at 7.2. So those are all the starting ranges, and then you can work up to the maintenance ranges. Just one thing to point out, if you look at the NEON PN on day seven, 
gives you still 8.6 grams per kilogram per day, which sounds low, but there is a provision within those prescriptions to give additional 10% glucose, which will bump up how much glucose you are actually delivering. Um, and also for SCAMP, there is a there is an um, uh, uh, there is a sort of uh, a provision to give additional 10% glucose to give additional fluid for the baby, which can bump up how much glucose you're giving. So you do when you do your calculations, you do actually need to think about how much 10% glucose am I giving? Does it need to be 5% glucose in order to decrease the glucose in the load on the baby? So just something to think about. So next coming on to lipids. Um, uh, so lipids are basically uh, made out of a glycerol backbone, which is a sort of three carbon backbone that you have here, and a fatty acid chain, which is attached to the three glycerol backbone. Um, and the sort of fatty acid chain it is determines the sort of lipid it is. And you can get um, um, no double bonds, which will be uh, uh, saturated fats, which will be uh, so double, so they're tightly packed together, so they will be solid at a room temperature, or you get vegetable fats, for example, olive oil, which are, uh, have lots of double bonds, which means the fatty acid chains are kinked, so they're not so tightly packed together, so they're liquid at room temperature. Um, the, we, we, there are also essential fatty acids which people, human beings, must eat, and these are your carbon-18 uh, fatty acids. In other words, there are 18 carbon atoms in that fatty acid chain, uh, and you need your carbon-18 fatty acids in order to make your long-chain fatty acids. And the important ones that you want to make are your DHA, which is a glucose hexanoic acid, which is a carbon-22 omega-3 uh, one, and arachidonic acid, which is your um, carbon-18 uh, uh, omega-6. Um, and the reason why these are important is because DHA helps you build your brain and your retina, and arachidonic acid is also important for your brain. Um, and just to say, as an aside, your medium chain triglycerides have medium lengths of chain of the carbon atoms, and they have about six to ten carbon chains in the fatty acids. So, what's important about long chain, short chain, medium chain fatty acids is that um, you take in your essential fatty acid, which is your omega three or your omega six carbon eighteen fatty acid, and then your body makes this into all the long chain fatty acids you, you need, but it's made on a competitive pathway. In other words, the more omega-3s you eat, the more you'll get traveling down this pathway. The more omega-6s you eat, the more you get traveling down this pathway. Why is that important? Because if you go along this pathway, the, the, the products of this pathway are anti-inflammatory acosinoids, which are important in preventing uh, diabetes, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and things like that. But if you go along this pathway, the omega-6 pathway, you get pro-inflammatory acosinoids, and these are the things that enable or help develop your type 2 diabetes and your cardiovascular disease. So why is that important is that we think that populations of people who have a high omega-3 intake have a lesser incidence of cardiovascular disease. And people who have high omega-6 fatty acid intake, i.e., for example, American diets are quite unbalanced in how much omega-6 versus omega-3 they have, uh, they have very high incidences of cardiovascular disease. Um, where do you get omega-3s? Omega-3s come essentially from your um, marine food chain, especially your long chain, DHA, comes from the marine food chain. Um, and there's a sort of theory about evolution which says that we didn't get to be smart human beings until we moved next to the sea and stopped eating curry wolves and ate fishes. And then we got lots of preformed omega-3 DHA, which helped our brains to grow. Interesting thought. Uh, okay, so coming on to lipids. Babies need, um, we think that long chain fatty acids are conditionally essential for preterm babies. In other words, they can make them from precursors, just like we can, grown ups, but not quite as well as we can. Okay, so it's likely that they need some preformed uh, long chain amino acids to help build their brain and retinas. That's important later. So, the, the other really, really important thing to remember is that you can't leave your preterm baby without lipid for more than two to three days, or else you will get an essential fatty acid deficiency. 
Okay, and this is really important because often when preterm babies get sick, um, people go, oh, let's turn the lipids down or let's switch the lipid off. And then nobody remembers to turn it back on again. Okay, so you can stave off your fatty acid deficiency by just giving a teeny tiny amount of lipids. So try and reduce your lipid intake if you've got reduced lipid tolerance shown by your triglyceride levels, but try not to switch it off entirely. Also remember, all your vitamins are in the lipid component. Okay, so if you're switching off your lipids, you're switching off your vitamins. Okay, there's two good bits of evidence out there about lipids uh, for babies. And there are these two bit, uh, bits here. The Flardinger Brook uh, uh, meta-analysis published in 2012 and the Cochrane Review published last year. The, the Flardinger Brook is slightly more reading uh, readable because it's looked at the sort of lipid preparations we have available here. Cochrane Review is slightly difficult to read because it compares every lipid against every other lipid solution you could possibly find. Okay, so it makes for um, yeah, difficult reading. But, but you know, it, the, the, that is the most up-to-date um, evidence review there is for lipids. So um, this is what the different lipid preparations look like that we have available. So intralipid is our oldest preparation. It's made from mostly soybean oil. And as you can see, it's got a high level of phytosterols. Why are phytosterols important? We think phytosterols are important because they have, we think they have an etiological role in PN associated liver disease. Then there are the mixed fatty acid preparations like clinoleic available, which have a sort of mixture of various things and they have a lower phytosterol content. We get SMOF lipid, which contains for the first time some preformed fish oil. So this, why fish oil? This was. This contains those long chain omega-3 fatty acids that we said come from the marine food chain that made us smart in the first in, in the first okay. so so these are your preformed dhas that you, that, that you can have for your neonatal brain um and then you also get things like omegavin which contains only fish oil um as you can see the small flip it also contains less uh, uh phytosterols which may be important as an etiological agent in. So we know that at the moment, in the Cochrane Review, especially there's limited evidence to say that fish oil preparations reduce pn associated liver disease in the preterm population. But this is also because most preterm babies don't need pn as their sole diet for very long. For most preterm babies, you are grading down on your PN and grading up on your enteral nutrition at the same time. So, so you know, most little babies within 14 days to three weeks, you really, even the little, little ones, you should be on mostly enteral feeds and you should be off your PN. Um, so you're not giving PN as your sole nutrition for very long. So actually, you don't need to take an awful lot of caution to prevent PN associated liver disease because that only develops after about two to three weeks. So it is probably important where PN represents your sole nutrition. So if you've got a preterm baby where you've stopped their feeds and they've been off feeds for yonks because they've had NEC and then they've had an operation and then, you know, blah, whatever, uh, and nobody started their feeds, then I think it's probably a good idea to give SMOF, which, which contains fish oil, because that contains those preformed long chain amino acids which are important for your brain which they're not getting in any other way because they're not getting mum's milk okay so that probably is a good idea so at the moment we use omegavin the fish oil only preparation as a treatment for pn associated liver disease but it's still we still use this very cautiously because there's some association with platelets uh, from its function or associated uh, for or only um, 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 PN cycling, this is a, a useful technique. We haven't got much uh, uh, evidence that it works for preterm babies. Also, it's really difficult to do in preterm babies because preterm babies just can't make that adaptation to fasting yet. Um, so, um, but PN cycling is certainly a useful trick to save off your PN associated liver disease for those term infants with long term gut dysfunction. So these are your nice lipid recommendations. Um, if starting parental nutrition for preterm and term babies, 
you give a starting dose of one to two grams per kilogram per day, and you gradually increase that to three to four. Um, and um, if you start after birth and not, and you start with a maintenance dose. Um, and then the other recommendation, which is in the NICE recommendations, is that if you have babies with parental nutrition associated liver disease, you should consider using um, a composite li li lipid emulsion, uh, for example, a fish oil containing emulsion. And I would add to that if you are using Kian as your sole nutrition for a prolonged period of time, you should again consider using a composite lipid emulsion. So, what's the recipe? This is really important. Um, and this is probably the most complicated bit of it all. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so when you're giving parental nutrition to babies, um, you should provide your non-nitrogen energy at 60 to 70%, non-nitrogen energy be 60 to 75% to carbohydrate and 25% to 40% lipid. So what we're saying there is that about a third of your energy should come from lipid and the rest of it should come from carbohydrate, not taking into account your protein, because your protein you're not supposed to be using as energy, you're supposed to be making tissue with us. Okay, so that's what that means. Um, so for every so for every gram of amino acids, you should have about 20 to 30 kilocalories of non-nitrogen energy. And non-nitrogen energy is the energy provided by your carbohydrate and your lipid component. And of that non-nitrogen energy envelope, about a third of it should be lipid. Okay. And that's really important because people often go, oh, baby's not growing, let's give some more lipid, and then that, and you don't think about the overall package that you're giving and how it's in balance. Okay. So please try and remember that while you're looking at um, baby yeah, prescriptions. The last thing to just talk about is uh, vitamins. These are now all in the lipid component, as we said before, both fat soluble and water soluble. Um, um, uh, vitamins are in uh, the lipid component, and all of it is given uh, through a light protective syringe and giving set. Okay, and the vitamin is also given in a light protective syringe and given set by days. And that's to, to prevent oxidation of, of your vitamins and to make sure that you're getting an effective delivery of vitamins to your babies. Um, the NICE recommendations also say that you should start vitamins as soon as possible. So this is important if you live in a DGH or actually if you live in a place where you don't have a 24-hour PN service, yeah, as, as some tertiary units do as well. But what you're going to do is you're going to start your baby that's all on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock on PN that you get off the shelf. And that PN off the shelf has not got vitamins or trace elements. You must swap that bag for a prescribed bag with vitamins and trace elements as soon as you can. Okay, so your off-the-shelf PN that you have available will probably not contain vitamins and trace elements because it reduces the shelf life of, of those bags. So do remember to that, that, that you need to make that switch as soon as you can. Okay. Also important about um, stopping your um, um, uh, lipid emulsion. If you stop your lipid emulsion for a prolonged period of time, you can then get um, vitamin deficiencies, especially a thiamine deficiency, which is uh, can be very, very serious and can present as an NEC type like illness. Okay. So please do try and remember not to stop your lipids for a long period of time. So starting recommendations, you start amino acids and lipid on the first day within eight hours. Don't hang around. All the PN uh, preparations that we have available in London can be given via a peripheral line. Both SCAMP and NEON can be given peripherally, so there is no excuse. You can't say, oh, we couldn't do the long line because we didn't have enough people on overnight or whatever. You can still start your PN and then you can muck around with the long line at your leisure the next day. Okay. Uh, so this is just your numbers which you've been through. And um, I'm just going to do a time check. So it's 10 past seven. I'm just going to go on to enteral fees, if that's okay with people. Oh, yeah. So yes or no? Yeah, okay. Still yes, more. please. Um, so um, so enteral fees, basically, uh, uh, the most important thing is to talk about human milk provision for babies and breastfeeding. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some specialist formulas that we have available as well. So uh, 
why talk about breastfeeding? These slides are from UNICEF uh, Baby Friendly. Um, does breastfeeding really matter? And the answer is both yes and no. And the, the reason why it matters is because it matters on a population type, from a population type perspective. And it says in, on the slide, you could save 820,000 lives a year if you had near universal uh, uptake of breastfeeding. How does that break down? It breaks down into 800,000 children's lives saved every year and 20,000 maternal lives from less breast cancer. Um, so th those are th that's an amazing statistic. And, and so from a population perspective, it is super duper important that, you, that we encourage breastfeeding at all times. But from an individual perspective, for an individual mother that you have in front of you, remember how hard those challenges are and remember to just support your mother and your families, whatever their choices they make. Um, so does breastfeeding really matter? Yes, breastfeeding has a significant impact on mortality and morbidity in both high and low income countries. And we reckon that sort of global economic losses from not breastfeeding are enormous. Um, and you could get huge savings for the NHS and for other healthcare systems if you manage to get your breastfeeding rates to near universal levels, because you would have less babies admitted in the first year of life with respiratory and gastrointestinal morbidity, and you would have less uh, late onset uh, juvenile diabetes and um, things like and, and allergic type disease, uh, and you will have less healthcare resource consumption from that. So is it worthwhile? You betcha. So what is the impact of not breastfeeding? Uh, this again, this slide is from Baby Friendly, if, when it pops up. Um, so you get reduced immune protection, uh, um, you get uh, reduced uh, um, educational attainments, um, you get higher risk of sudden infant death, and NEC, we'll go through that in a bit more detail, and also you get um, uh, those long-term illnesses like obesity and diabetes, dental decay, and for mums you get breast and ovarian cancer, and we also think that breastfeeding helps with um, postnatal depression. So all in all, it's a really good thing. What are the constituents? So both, they can, both contain water. For a formula milk, you have to go through the whole schlep of sterilizing it and boiling it and cooling it. And, ugh. and for breastfeeding, obviously, is applied at exactly the right temperature in a sterile way. Both of them contain protein. Uh, the proteins for in human milk are obviously specific carbohydrate, fats, and then human milk contains a whole lot of other stuff, which makes it this incredibly amazing biological soup. Um, uh, it's a bit like, it's, I guess it's a bit like blood in terms of it's a biological fluid with a huge amount of components that are uh, have additional benefits for babies. So, it's, so breast milk is not just about feeding, it's about all the other biological advantages you can get. This, to go through some of the immune benefits, um, is um, uh, IgA is a major immune component you find in breast milk, which helps uh, uh, with gut maturation, helps your specific immune response, lactoferrin, uh, lysozyme, cytokines. We think that breast milk contains this amazing admixture of anti-inflammatory cytokines, which are really, really important, as we think, in NEC prevention. Um, oligosaccharides, there's a lot of uh, work done to say that, that formula milk does not contain oligosaccharides, but human milk contains more than 200 unique oligosaccharides, uh, which have uh, specific roles in enhancing the growth of uh, your helpful bacteria in your gut. And, and, and also, um, yeah, so, so they also prevent binding of pathogens to the enteric and respiratory surfaces. Um, this is a really old slide, but it's a goodie, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving it to you again. So basically, this kind of explains how mums provide breast milk, which is specific to their babies in that environment. So as a mum, you meet um, antigens, which which uh, go, which uh, meet your pears patches in your respiratory and gastrointestinal epithelium. You then make um, you then get antigen simulated lymphocytes, which then make antibodies, and that antibody finds its way into the breast milk. So the mother protects the baby against the antigens and bacteria that are in her environment. It's a really good system. Okay, so 
We also know that that um, the breast milk is part of the microbiome which the mother gives the baby. Um, and we know that, there's, that this is sort of an exponentially increasing area of research. We know that the, the microbiome affects your long-term health as a long-term benefit on your health. Um, and your, how do you get your microbiome? You get it from vaginal birth, skin to skin, really, really important, and breastfeeding. Okay, so those are the things that will establish the baby's microbiome. Um, and the, the oligosaccharides find it, found in human milk will feed that microbiome. And the microbiome evolves and develops with that baby. What are the benefits of having that microbiome? You get your vitamin K, you get other nutrients, you get, uh, it helps your immune system to develop, um, and it also helps your healthful bacteria to grow and it blocks your bacteria, basically. And we think particularly um, the microbiome is helpful against preventing NEC in the preterm infant population. The key message is about breast milk really that it's um, a species specific, baby and mother and baby specific, incredibly important biological soup. Um, and um, you know that that's, it has uh, long-term effects long after you cease breastfeeding, which is incredibly uh, amazing thought really that that breast milk has such a, a a good effect so the next thing about breastfeeding is does it make you smarter and the small a short answer is yes okay, so there's a lot of pushback on, on this idea on in the internet to say that well it's um educated and smart mothers who breastfeed and therefore they read books to their babies and therefore they have smarter babies but actually uh, this particular work which goes back to the 1990s uh, showed that uh, for uh, uh, population of preterm infants whose mothers wanted to breastfeed but were not able to, uh, they were subdivided into uh, those given amazing formula Y and those given human milk, uh, only donor human milk. And at 18 months, they looked at those babies again and the ones that had human milk were small and skinny, but outperformed all the babies given amazing formula Y um, on the Bailey's test. Okay, so yes, it makes you smarter. And the smaller you are, the more preterm you are, the bigger your developmental leg up from having breast milk. So what about um, breast milk for preterm infants? So lots and lots of doctors are worried about the fact that human milk isn't nutritious enough for the preterm infant. And that, that is a fair criticism because human milk is made for term infants. So breast milk is still the milk of choice for preterm infants because of that reduced risk of NEC, uh, because it bolsters poor innate immunity. This, this little uh, diagram on the side here shows you the transplacental transfer of IgE with increasing gestation. So if you miss out on most of the third trimester of gestation, you miss out on most of the immune, the innate immunity which your mother will give to you because it hasn't happened yet. So uh, we know that uh, breast milk helps protect against nosocomial infection, and we said it makes you smarter. And we also think it has an, a role in preventing inflammatory type illnesses such as ROP and BPD. Um, just to come back to that NEC risk, the most recent work is from Cheryl, uh, published in 2017, Cheryl Battersby, um, which showed a far higher number needed to treat to prevent NEC in our preterm baby population. And this is interesting, I think it was about one in 114. That is interesting information, but the take home message for me from that paper was that actually that health message about how good breast milk is at preventing NEC in the preterm population has really embedded itself in the UK healthcare system. And that means that our background rate of NEC far lower than those countries where that message is not so entrenched. So that is a, a really important point. We talked about um, the nutritional insufficiency of, of uh, human milk for preterm infants. And this is really because why the kangaroo, I hear you say, well, the kangaroo really is because they've worked it out better. So, so when kangaroos give birth, they give birth to little uh, joeys, which are about the size of a lima bean, uh, which are equivalent to a very immature fetus, you know, sort of about 10 to 12 weeks gestation for us, pulls its way into the pouch and attaches itself to the nipple. And the breast milk provided to that little joey at that point is exactly what a very immature fetus needs. And as the joey matures and starts hopping out 
I got, uh, you know, out of the pouch and eating some leaves and stuff, that that milk will change. Um, and we initially thought that people were like that and that they produced breast milk for preteen babies, which was higher in protein and higher in salt. But actually, we now know that within about two weeks of lactation, you produce breast milk as if you are producing for a tame infant. And that milk will be short on the amount of protein that you need. So the, the major rate limiting step for term breast milk is that it contains not enough protein for the preterm infant, hence the need for a, a protein supplement which is best supplied by a multi-nutrient fortifier. What's the downside? Uh, possible increased risk of NEC I've put down here, although there have now been uh, at least two Cochrane reviews which have said that there isn't a risk, risk of increased NEC. And um, you also have to remember that nothing in life is risk-free. So it's balancing the risk of extremely poor growth versus a much smaller risk of NEC. Um, so um, I, I would, uh, for, for us, we now routinely use Fortifier for all babies less than 1.5 kilos. The second point is quite an important one, is that mothers have a perception that their milk is not good enough. And so you need to provide that dialogue about how good their milk is, how good it is for their baby's neurodevelopment, um, and to say that the fortification is only there because of you know, the sort of biological reason of not having enough protein because the body thinks it's lactating for a um, So this, this last point is basically uh, about uh, promoting post-discharge um, use of fortifier and, and even milk post-discharge. I'll come back. So what's in breast milk fortifier? It depends a bit on the brand you use. Most of it is made from cow's milk, although there's a big push into the UK market for human milk-derived human fortifier. And just to say that uh, the evidence behind that product is not there at the moment. Uh, so there's a big sort of marketing push to say that there's less NEC with that product. And the study on which that big marketing push is based is uh, there's serious flaws. It's the Sullivan et al. paper from 2010. And um, the, the, the flaws in that paper are that it was sponsored by the people who make the human milk fortifier and that the background rate of NEC in that study is, you know, about 10 times what it is in the UK. I don't think we're looking at comparable populations at all. Um, so at the moment, you are still fine to use a cow's milk derived um, fortifier with, uh, you know, as a safe and good product to use. Um, so what does it contain? Calcium, phosphate, because you need those for bone growth. Um, and it contains some trace elements, especially zinc, because the level of zinc goes down in human milk as the length of lactation progresses. Also contains extra sodium, which is another important rate limiting step. So this is what the fortified milk looks like, it has a little bit more calories, but mostly it has more protein. Are all breast milk fortifier regimes the same? Most UK people use standard fortification, so you take your little sachet, you pop it in the milk, and the problem with that is that you don't know what that mother's milk is like. Okay, for example, if you're expressing for twins or if you're expressing very high volumes of milk, you will produce milk that is, has lower protein content. So you may be providing fortified milk at 150 ml per kilo per day, and you may still not be providing enough protein, which is why if your baby's growth is not good on 150, it's fine to go up to 165 or 180 or whatever you need, because you don't know what, what the thing was that you started with. Adjustable fortification is the idea that you put in a standard amount and then you add extra protein. I don't think we're quite there yet because we don't have a good biomarker to tell us exactly how to do that. And um, target fortification is basically where you analyze your mum's milk and you add in the thing that you need. Uh, it's a very attractive idea. Uh, again, I don't think we're quite there yet because we have at the moment bedside analyzers which have been derived by the dairy industry and where the human milk and, and cow's milk differ is that uh, cow's milk has got uh, all those amazing oligosaccharides in it which mess up your lactose measurement in your milk and so you don't get an accurate carbohydrate measurement on your dairy analyzers your bedside analyzers and so your total calorie content is off as well so we're not quite there yet with that but I await the next 
analyzer, the next uh, sort of you know sort of generation of analyzer with great interest, and we'll kind of move that along if we possibly can. But coming back to formula milks, while breastfeeding is the holy grail of all neonatal care, it's important to remember that the majority of families in the UK will end up being formula feeding families. And so when you get them back to clinic, it's important that you are able to give them supportive advice about what they do about formula feeding, okay, which is non-judgmental. So the most important point on the slide is this little thing here, which says First Nutrition Trust. This is your source of information about formula milks in the UK. Do not look at manufacturers information because it just isn't, it, it, it isn't, that's not information, it's advertising. This is a website which scientifically analyzes what's in the formula milk and tells you what the evidence is behind each of those components. Uh, a really, really good resource. It also gives super handy info about uh, what to do if you have a vegan toddler or etc. and gives you really, really good advice about portion control for toddlers and all sorts of other things. Mine of information, I recommend. Okay, so remember that most formula milks are derived from cow's milk and they're then modified in a variety of ways. They're super expensive as you can see. Coming on to specialist formula milks, uh, the basic one that, that, that we have available to us is a preterm formula, which contains more protein, calcium, phosphate, sodium, and zinc. Okay. Um, so, so that will promote the growth of a preterm infant. And that's what we use. There's a big push to say you should use partially hydrolyzed preterm formula, and at the moment, the evidence for that is just not there. Okay, people say it's more digestible, blah blah blah. Uh, it just it isn't right. I'm sorry. You know, you can just use a preterm formula. Other specialist milk that we use a lot of is Infantrini, which is a high energy milk, and that's really useful for babies where you have a really high energy demand. For example, a baby with chronic lung disease, um, or a baby with congenital heart disease, who needs a high energy intake, but uh, they get readily tired by their feeding, and they have, you know, this is a really super useful adjunct to, in your armaments. And other specialist formula milks are progestin and peptidunia, which are hydrolyzed and also contain MCTs, and neocate, which is completely hydrolyzed and contains amino acid and MCTs. So MCTs, why are they important? Is because they're absorbed straight into your lacteals and they kind of bypass the liver, and so they're really useful in babies with liver disease. The caveat to that is that if you have a choice between mother's milk and progestin milk or an MCT containing milk, you should always have mother's milk, okay? Because it has all that other really good stuff that you need to use. So this is a really important point, and then I'll, I'll, I know I'm nearly out of time, but is breastfeeding after discharge for the pregnant infant important? And short answer is yes. The longer you breastfeed, the more the cognitive leg up that you get, okay? so. Please don't kind of go, oh, you've done the most important thing by discharge. It's fine for you to formula feed now. Um, try and encourage post-discharge breastfeeding. So um, there's a big push for us to prescribe these post-discharge formulas, and, and there isn't a lot of evidence for them. Okay. What I would suggest is that for a breastfed infant where growth is suboptimal at the time of discharge, you could try using something like a fortifier shot. A fortifier shot is when you use a sachet fortifier in a small amount of breast milk and you give it with a spoon uh, and then you give the baby a breastfeed afterwards. And you give about three sachets a day to support that baby's protein and, and other calorie intake. Um, and why is that important is because it gives a really, really different message to going, here, have this bottle of, you know, sort of a wonderful uh, formula milk, which is going to support your baby's growth um, versus we're going to give this fortifier mixture, but your breast milk is still the most important part of this. So um, um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in fortifier shots for breastfed infants. Um, the reason why you even need fortifier shots is that most term infants are able to self-regulate their intake. So in other words, if they need to grow, they'll take in more breast milk. If, they, if they're not having a growth spurt, they won't take in more breast milk. But preterm infants are, uh, are less able to do that supply demand thing because we are discharging them sooner and sooner. So you're discharging a baby at 33, 34 weeks cessation, and they haven't quite got that supply and demand thing. So you need to support that. 
with your fortifier shot. Okay, so in summary, breast milk is always the most important thing you can do for babies. You know, I know that as neonatologists, we love our technology, don't we? We love um, the, the servo controlled ventilators and, and the, the super smart uh, gadgets that we have. And um, I think actually, you know, more than the, the, the smart gadgets that we have in the neonatal units, what we need to do for our babies is make sure they have breast milk and they go home breastfed. And that will give them an amazing sort of neurodevelopmental leg up. And it's worth remembering that when you're selling in the middle of the night titrating your inotropes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I've got to the end and, and I'm, I know I'm, I'm a bit over time. So I don't know if people will um, need to rush off or anything. Are there any questions? I think there was one question in the chat. Um, okay. I think it's about, I think it was in the part about TPN, um, the, mm -hmm. the amounts that you start at, is it irrespective of any gestational age? Yes, so, so the PN recommendations are divided into term and preterm. And, and that's, that's uh, uh, so, so, and that's irrespective of just that. So the preterm is less than 31 weeks, well, is less than 33 weeks, basically. And the term, you would, uh, it's divided into term and preterm, basically. That's the only gestational age category there is. I haven't answered that very well, but that's what, that's what I meant. Was there anything else? Uh, uh -huh. Okay. I think that was it. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Okay, um, okay great. That on there. Um, and I'll just put the link. Uh, people can provide feedback um, uh, for the session um, at this link. Um, and uh, there's a learning session on nutrition actually in the pack in this link as well, which will add on nicely to what you've talked about. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you guys. Have a good evening. Bye. Oh, oh. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>